if I were to ask you the question, what race am I? What would be your response? Would you call me American, black, white? Or would you ask me the question, what race is my dad? And the reason why you would ask what race is my dad is because you're trying to answer these two questions. One, am I really black? And two, what's the authenticity of my blackness? And to answer the question bluntly, I'm biracial. My mom is white and my dad is black. Then you're probably wondering, well, if my dad is black, then why don't I say so? Well, the answer is this. Genuinely, I am biracial. One of my parents is white and the other one is black. And it's 50-50. It's mixed. So biracial is the proper term to use. The idea that mixed people are black just because their father is black, one, doesn't make sense because why does it matter based off of which parent is black? And then secondly, it doesn't make sense because the idea that mixed people are black is an extension of the one drop rule, which is a racist white supremacist doctrine. It is essentially saying that if you have one drop of African ancestry blood inside of your system, then you by default are black. And it was used to further purify the white race and have mixed people as outcast as lo alongside with black people. And there's an infamous story, whether it's real or a legend, but regardless, it does show the same exact point. There was a white woman that was gonna be charged for dealing with some type of black person, whatever she was doing, but she was doing, uh, at, the, at the time, doing something illegal, and she was gonna get charged. So she bit the finger of the black guy, and he drew blood, and therefore, she, and then she consumed it. And she turned around at the police officer and whoever was charging her was like, well, I consumed his blood. Now I have African ancestry inside of me. Are you still going to charge me or are you going to follow up on your laws and essentially say that I'm black now? What is it going to be? And she essentially pressured their consistency. The purpose of bringing up that story is to show how ridiculous the idea of just because you have some type of African blood in you, therefore you are by default African. And all of this goes to show how peculiar the um, like the Western way of categorizing people. Nowhere else in the world do people really do black and white. It's only, only kind of like an American thing. Everywhere else in the world, like people are French, British, Chinese, Japanese. And then America, you got like black and white people. It's like, what? And there's two major reasons why this social categorization of people kind of persist. It's one, during the 1830s, the weaponization of blackness really became prominent. The reason being is because pro-intellectual, pro pro-slavery intellectuals really kind of uh, stood up and started arguing against blackness and really had a, a hatred toward back blackness because they were like, whoa, black people want to become free and have jobs and want to live independently and therefore destroy the institution of slavery we're not going to be for that at all so they really started coming up with really deeply hatred hating racist arguments and so on and so forth anytime before then it was more so like scientific and like anybody else was like well according to my scientific inquiry uh, black people just seem to be the inferior race and that's what science is but like in the 1830s and then on it was like really like rooted in hatred for you know black people because it's like how dare you want to undermine the institution of slavery and gain freedom and the reasons why these social categories still continue to persist is because the government has adopted these social categories of ways of making law so for an example you have the jim crow jim crow happens and stuff like that and whether or not you're really affiliated with blackness or whatnot you're kind of forced to affiliate yourself with blackness because you have to fight against Jim Crow, and Jim Crow is a target on your back back just because you're black. And then you move forward in the 1960s and so on and so forth, and then you have this big, big civil uh, disagreement, and you're like, we need voting rights as black people and whatnot, and so you're forced into the category to associate yourself with blackness because there are laws against you, and you have to fight to liberate yourself as well. And then after the 1960s, you have the complete opposite, where laws are, gi are given in favor of blackness, such as racial quotas, affirmative action, and the lowering of educational standards and so on and so forth so if you really want those things you really got to fight and align yourself with blackness and so on and so forth and 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 in reverse that kind of made people align or white people align with one another because there's like oh my god they're attacking white people and so on and so forth but that's another conversation but that's the historical and contemporary reasons as to why these social categories still continue to persist today but the history and the why these social categories exist is not the purpose of the video the purpose of the video is to ask this simple question what is race this question was motivated earlier in the month of June because I attended a philosophy conference. It's an annual philosophy con conference hosted by the Ayn Rand Institute. And this particular one was in Anaheim, California, which I loved it. But there was a speaker there named Greg Salamieri, and he gave a speech on racism and why it persists. 
And throughout the entirety of the lecture and the entirety of the question period, no one answered the question, what is race? So I became the person to ask that question. Now, although I can't recite Greg Salamieri verbatim, I can name the essentials of what he said with my own little twist. But race is a social categorization of people based off of a distinctive phenotypical trait that is regarded as important. And what do I mean by important? I mean that the phenotypical trait is you, you ascribe some social, moral, or political significance to it. That this trait somehow influences or determines the way that you interact socially, the moral choices that you make, or somehow this is regarded as uh, politically important. It means that because you have this phenotypical trait, therefore your moral character is tainted in some way, whether good or bad. It has been determined that you are you're more subject to committing certain actions and stuff like that. For an example, if people say that, well, if you're black, then you have a low IQ and you're more subject to committing crimes and lying and cheating and so on and so forth, just because you have a darker pigmented skin. But there's another part of that definition that's significant. And it's the based off of the fact that it's based off of a distinctive phenotypical trait. It doesn't necessarily have to be skin color. There could potentially be a new social category of people that's based off of just long headedness, a new race of human beings that just have a distinctive, a distinctively long head. And people can come and say, well, you know, these people are bad. They're more subject to doing X, Y, and Z because they just have this phenotypical trait that we designate as long heads. And this is a different race of human beings. And, they, and then it's very, the people can really do that. And people already do that. I mean, like how many times have you seen the stereotype of Jewish people with long noses? Or with the Germans when it comes to blonde hair and blue eyes. But the major reason as to why skin color has been chosen as the primary example for the concept of race is all in, in this book right here. Ayn Rand, The Virtue of Selfishness, she has, a, she has a chapter in here called Racism. And she says, she doesn't say it like this, but she essentially says that race, the reason why race has been the primary example for uh or the primary reason as to why color has been used as an example for race is because it's the easiest to create a sense of community a, a sense of uh, association and it requires the less amount of effort and a less the least amount of energy that's what i mean at least amount of energy and effort to be associated it's essentially saying man i look kind of dark you look kind of dark we're meant to be we should be a part of the same band together and sing kumbaya that's exactly what, and it's, it's literally a caveman type of philosophy. And essentially saying that a human being is not their mind, it's not their character, it's not the values and ideas and their moral choices and their personal philosophy it has. A person is their skin tone, and you're associating with people based off of their skin tone as opposed to who they really are. But another great author, Anne Wortham, with her book called The Other Side of Racism, she provides a contention to that. And she essentially says that the process of racialization, as I said before, is getting some phenotypical trait and then providing some type of social moral or uh, political importance to that and that's the process of racialization right race doesn't mean anything right I d identifying skin color or some phenotypical trait doesn't mean anything unless you provide or make it important and so that's the process of racialization but she, she essentially says that your race or your phenotypical trait that we're talking about is nothing more is nothing more than what reality is given to you. It is just some bare, naked, metaphysical fact. Your race or your typical trait or just you in general is given to you by reality and reality says nothing of its importance. Only people can make your certain physical traits important. Only people, the judgments of other people. And if you're a true individualist and you wish to really live your individual life, that means that you don't care about the opinions, feelings, and judgments of other people, and you're not going to allow those things to dictate what you can and cannot do, then the idea that you're going to be associating with race or the idea that you should take pride in the idea that you are a particular race or have certain phenotypical traits wouldn't make any sense. For an example, if I were to say, you know, get rid of the idea of black and white pride. And if you're a black person watching this video, how does that make you feel? There's probably two areas, and I've been there, but there's probably two areas that your mind immediately went to. Is one, that my blackness has been threatened by the idea that I should de denounce the idea of black pride. And two, how would other black people think of me if I just completely just denounce black pride? And that's precisely the psychological in context that Ann Wortham is talking about in her book. She's essentially saying that 
you are being alienated from your self-identity, which means the values and philosophy that you choose to adopt. But you're using kind of this overarching social category called blackness in order to dictate how you should interact with certain things and what you should take pride in and what you should take value in. And in this case, you're using blackness in a sense. And so the fact that you immediately felt threatened, you didn't felt threatened, but your blackness, this overarching category you're a part of felt threatened. You didn't feel threatened. And the second thing was that you thought of how other people would perceive you, which means that your persona, your personal identity is, or personal identity is being judged by other people and you don't like that feeling. You don't feel, you don't feel like being outcasted by a group that you really want a part of. And the question is, why do you want to be a part of that group? Just, be, just based off of the fact that you guys may have a shared history and you guys look alike. And that's the type of idea that me and Ayn Rand and other people are trying to challenge. Why do you associate with other people just because they look like you? It's a little weird. That's the end of the video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you want to check out the books, links are in the description. Also, if you want to check out my publication that talks about this exact same topic, you can check out the link in the description as well. With that being said, pick up a book, stay scholarly.